even college education courses unless you take a class specifically on Native American history and or literature. So I have to remember to click. There we go. Okay. So first I want to start out by defining what genocide is in terms of the UN. So the UN terms genocide, um, this is from 1951, defined as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national ethic, ethnic, racial, or religious group, such as killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to the group, del deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of a life calculated to bring about physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And so I'm going to be talking about the forced removal and pressure to educate and assimilate these native children and people into white American society. Um, and they are prongs of genocide. Um, and I also do want to preface this. I will be talking about abuse and sexual abuse, just to kind of give you a heads up. So. so by the time that white settlers come here, they see Indians as a nuisance. And by the 1790s, they're trying to figure out, well, what do we do with these people? How can we get rid of them? They're bothering us. They're in our way. Um, so they're trying to solve the Indian problem. So in 1819, they created the Civilization Fund Act, which encouraged white Christians or any other religious group to basically provide education for Native Americans by civilizing them. And these supposed, you know, they see themselves as like benevolent societies, things like that, were in charge of providing the education. And there were no rules really on this. Um, it was just Christian missionaries and the federal government gave them go ahead, like, yeah, go ahead, do that. Um, so in 1824, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was created to help kind of oversee this. And it was created by John Calhoun. Um, and it was placed into the War Department section of the government, and this saw the Christian, oversaw the Christian missionary schools that worked to educate the Native peoples. Um, the white Christian missionaries believed it was kind of their duty to help civilize and educate these people, because it was a calling from God. Um, and so thus began kind of the first schools to educate the Natives. Um, however, <laughs> um, the Christian schools weren't seen as effective enough. They weren't assimilating enough Indian people or students and getting them to assimilate to white culture. So during the Civil War, uh, a man named Henry Richard Pratt sat, thought about, OK, how can we get them to assimilate more? And he thought of boarding schools. So he, um, his motto was, kill the Indian in him, save the man. So basically stripping away every part of a native's personality, their culture, everything about them, in order to then put them into white society, where hopefully they could become a real person type of idea. Um, and the government believed kind of Pratt's ideology that the problem could be achieved through intensive and rigorous uh, assimilation programs such as boarding schools, literally taking the children and removing them far from home. Um, so these boarding schools would eradicate native culture and turn natives into semi-productive individuals of American society. And they believe that these schools would help educate and free these savages from their backwards ways. Um, and as you all probably know, the US government and white individuals look down on natives, their lifestyles, their cultures, their history, um, how they educated their children, basically anything to do with their lives. And they believe that they were saving these people in some ways or trying to get them to be productive members of society. And it's kind of the trope we see in movies. The white benevolent savior comes and um, rescues these backwards, horrible barbarians and teaches them the right way to live. Um, so as I said, Richard Henry Pratt, sorry, I'm making sure I'm on the right slides and all that good stuff. Um, he was uh, a soldier during the um, for the Union during the Civil War, and he began experiments on Native Americans imprisoned at Fort Marion in Florida in 1870 to see if his boarding school program might work. And the government did buy into it and believed that you could kill the Indian in, in him and save the man. So he believed that if you took Native children and placed them hundreds if not thousands of miles away from uh, 
their group or family that they would then have those ties severed and it would be easier to force them to read, write, and speak English um, and assimilate to the American way of life. Um, and he believed that you needed to literally, as I said, strip every piece or part of a native identity away from a child. Um, and he focused on the European concepts of order, space, beauty, as well as the Victorian norms of respectability, discipline, and well-being. So this is just one of the quotes from him. The Indians need the chances of participation you have had, and they will just as easily become useful citizens. Really showcasing how most white individuals saw natives, that they were just a nuisance, they were bothersome, and they needed to either be dispensed with or they need to assimilate to white culture. So again, he believed it was his duty to try and solve this Indian problem. And he believed that you would have to use corporal punishment in a lot of cases in order for students to begin assimilating to white culture in order to sever those ties. So this is just uh, a picture of Richard Henry Pratt. He founded the Carlisle Indian School, the first boarding school, um, in 1879. And he was the headmaster there for many years. Um, and this is just one of the native boys speaking to Pratt. So then I have this quick little quiz. So how many Ameri many uh, children were forced into Native American boarding schools? Do you guys have a guess? Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, the best estimated population for Native Americans in America in 1880 was around 244,000 people. So the 100,000 is over the lifetime of forced boarding schools. But in 30 years from 1870 to 1880, the native population dropped by over 100,000 people uh, because of disease, war, famine, all that good stuff, um, biological attacks. Um, and then from 1870 to 1980, that is when 100,000 children went through forced boarding schools. Um, and they were forced to assimilate to white culture at any cost. So how did they get the children to these boarding schools? There were three main ways. One was brute force, coercion, and then some volunteers. So brute force, this literally involved US government or people literally just going into native communities and taking the children and leaving with them um, and removing them hundreds of miles away and parents had no idea where their children went. The other one was coercion, which was usually the more popular method where they said, you know, there were a couple of different tactics where they said, um, your community has to fill a quota of how many children you have to give to us, and we will give you your rations. But if you do not fill that quota, you will not be getting rations or help from the government in any way. There was also um, families would be told, you can send two of your children, and we won't take the rest. So things like that. Um, happened and sometimes the native communities would send the feeble-minded or weak children to these boarding schools and try and keep their stronger children with them. Um, and so the hope was by not taking every single child, there wouldn't be as much of an outrage, but it, they also hoped that when the children would come back, having been educated and assimilated to the white ways of life, that they would then transfer this knowledge um, to their community. So it was kind of seen as a way to, I guess, yeah, transfer that information and those ways of life over to their other family members and the community as a whole, hoping that they would all then adopt the white American ways. Um, so the Americanization that happened at these schools was pretty horrific in how they went about it, obviously. So as I said, remove the children as far away from their homes as possible. Um, they were forced to renounce all ways of tribal life. So when they would arrive at the school, they would be stripped of their clothes, their moccasins, everything that had to do with their native life. Um, and then they would not be allowed to speak anything other than English. And if they spoke anything other than English, they would be beaten, whether by ruler, by hand, whatever. Um, they would receive abuse. Um, they would also have to wear muslin clothes, something very different from the traditional clothes they were used to. They would have new names, Christian names, and they would be assigned surnames. The idea behind assigning surnames was that they 
the US government hoped that when they left school and started like um, inheriting land from the Indian property, that they would then, you know, be able to take it from them or, you know, they would have assimilated to the white life that they would be more willing to accept the ideas of manifest destiny and westward expansion and things like that. Um, so in addition to the change of clothes, they would cut off their hair. Um, and as you know, in some cultures, the sign of long hair is a sign of strength, of warriors, of things like that, and it ties closely to their identity. Um, so I don't know how many of you know Zikla Shah, the Native American writer. Um, I'm gonna read a couple of little passages from her um, where she wrote about her experience at the boarding schools. So she said, our mothers had taught us that only unskilled warriors who were captured had their hair shingled by the enemy. Among our people, short hair was worn by mourners and shingled hair by cowards. And so she goes to then talk about her experience with the boarding school. And when she was eight years old, she went off um, to the boarding school because they also got uh, children volunteering to go to boarding schools because it was glamorized and they used a lot of propaganda to get children saying over in the east you'll have apple trees and you'll be fed all the time and things are wonderful happy and rosy and perfect um, when really they were not so she also said um, I remember being dragged out thought I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly in spite of myself I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair I cried aloud shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit. Since the day I was taken from my mother, I had suffered extreme indignities. People had stared at me. I had been tossed about in the air like a wooden puppet. And now my long hair was shingled like a coward's. In my anguish, I moaned for my mother, but no one came to comfort me. Not a soul reasoned quietly with me, as my own mother used to do. For now, I was one of only one of the many little animals driven by a herder. So that was a very common practice where they would literally tie or restrain um, the children in order to cut off their hair. And it was a very humiliating and just degrading experience. So one example is Tom Trillino. It's not the greatest picture. But this is his before and after spending time at the Carlisle School. And as you can see, his hair had been completely cut short, and he was no longer allowed to wear any tribal um, clothing. So here's just another picture to kind of show that um, any individuality was stripped away from these children as well. And then this, I like the <coughs> contrast between the boys who had been at the school and the boy's father and the littlest brother um, who came to visit the two older boys at the school. So the life at school um, was not great at all. Uh, they were forced to speak English at all times, and if they didn't, they were abused or their rations were withheld from them um, or forced to do manual labor, things like that. Um, sometimes the punishment of the child then caused them to die because they were deathly ill already. Um, the schools worked to instill values of individualism, which was something very contrary to Native life. They had a more communal idea and um, ideology, and they believed that no one really owned land, which was very contrary to what, uh, obviously, white individuals in America believed, that you could literally own a piece of land. Um, so they wanted these children to believe that something like land could be possessed and possessed by one, by one person, and that they hoped by instilling this value that they would get natives who are willing to lay claim to land um, in the name of manifest destiny or things like that. Um, they also emphasized the importance for material wealth and materialism and gain. Um, they also placed a really heavy emphasis on Christianity um, so they taught like the Ten Commandments, the Psalms, things like that, in hoping of like instilling guilt and sin into these children so they'd be more easily manipulated by the US government. Um, they were also forced to celebrate white holidays like Christmas, you know, Christian holiday, Thanksgiving, where it was taught that the white settlers who landed in America were the kind and helpful men that helped these savages, you know, turn their lives around and become civilized, productive people. 
Um, they're also forced to celebrate New Year's Day to conform to the uh, white and American way of telling time. Uh, Columbus Day uh, to celebrate the man who found this wonderful nation and you know all of you uncivilized people and we are helping you now, we are here. Um, and then they were forced to celebrate Memorial Day where a lot of the times the children would have to go to cemeteries and decorate the graves of white soldiers who had killed their own people. Um, and then obviously history was taught with a lot of white bias um, that the white settlers found this nation of backwards and savage people and they are generous in helping <coughs> you to become productive people. Um, and in other times they would have plays uh, where the students would have to reenact the first Thanksgiving and they thought that by doing those plays they'd come around to the white point of view. Um, it was also really poor conditions at these schools, things like TB, the flu, cholera, um, scarlet fever, just like ran rampant all over. Um, so during Carlisle's operation between 1879 and 1918, over 200 children died and were buried in the cemetery. Other schools would just bury the children in a mass cemetery and there's no record of how many children died. Um, also, the children were rented out um, to white families during the summers, school vacation, or just during, during the school year. So it was basically a form of slavery. Um, so the children would be expected to do like domestic labor, um, you know, had to cook, clean, perform the domestic household duties. Uh, the boys would have to go out and do manual labor, such as work in fields, um, farming. And this was such like menial work that not even like immigrants would want to do this. This was left to the native children. Um, and so they'd be doing this all day instead of receiving the supposed education. Yes? Could you just remind me again, what were the years, the span of years that when the school started and when they were finally closed down? Um, 1879 to 1979. Um, so then the reason why they had these renting out practices was so that they would keep the children from going back home during the school breaks where they thought that their families or communities would undermine the teachings that the white schools have done. Um, and so also, obviously, abuse was rampant at these schools. These children were beaten for anything and everything. It was very much run like a military institution where children were regimented, um, you know, no playing. And if you did play, you were beaten. Or if you spoke anything other than English, you were beaten, anything like that. Um, and so, Life was just really, really awful at these places. Um, they had very little nutrition as well. These places weren't well funded, so children were starving a lot of the times. And if any disease did come through, a lot of children would be wiped out um, by that. And this was all in the name of assimilation. So here's an example or a picture. I don't know if you can see it. This is one of the schools where it's literally children like being forced to march and do drills and things like that. And at these schools, they told people that it was going to be an education where they'd learn to read, write, and speak English. And then they'd you know, have a job during the day. Um, but usually it came out to be, they were basically doing all the tasks to keep, to have the upkeep of the school. They didn't have employees to keep um, the school you know, in mechanical health or you know, anything like that. These children were doing the sewing, the cooking, the cleaning for the whole entire school. Um, so that's just another picture where the children are being forced to sew for the entire, you know, school, or sometimes they would be forced out into the white communities where they'd have to perform those tasks. Where was that school picture, was pictured? I didn't have the information of which school it was, but a lot of schools are run very much like that. What was the source? Um, I don't have the source on me. I can see if I can find it after. But a lot of them came from like the Carlisle School. But I can look back later. Um, sorry, lost my place. So when these children would return home, they would have such an education where they hope that the education would then permeate the native communities and this was how they would assimilate the entire native population. Um, 
But after a lot of children returned, they no longer fit into their own community because these schools would take them for years on end. And when they'd return, they'd have very little ability to even communicate in their own language. And since a lot of Native communities didn't have a regimented educational system, um, children were never really taught how to read, write, and speak in their native language, as well as they ended up being able to read, write, and speak English. So they were really limited to only speaking English. Um, and that they, um, they wore different clothing, as I said. They were forced to wear like muslin clothing and sneakers or other shoes instead of moccasins. And these children, when they went back home, felt alienated by their own communities, but also didn't feel like they quite fit in with the white community, because obviously they usually had a different skin color or things like that. So they felt isolated. And so the US government actually did this somewhat on purpose to hope that they felt alienated enough from their own community that they would just continue to assimilate to white culture. Um, so then, when did the US government uh, stop forcing students to attend boarding schools? Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was not until 1978 when Congress passed a law that allowed parents to refuse their children, you know, that they didn't have to go to boarding schools. Um, so I'm guessing a lot of you are most half were born before 1978 or so, and yeah, parents didn't have the legal right to say, no, you're not taking my child, or no, my child is not going to these boarding schools until 1978. Um, yeah. During the, the mid-20th century, uh, while the law was still in effect, were they mostly taking school of children off reservations, or were, they, or were they taking natives who lived out in broader communities? Both. They were just taking any natives they could really get a hold of. Um, but they would definitely go to reservations and try and use propaganda to get a lot of students to volunteer, or children to volunteer to go. And then, you know, they're there for, you know, six, eight years or something like that. Um, so then the effect of the boarding schools that had on these children, they, as I said, they would go home and they found that they no longer fit into their own tribe. Um, they faced racial discrimination in their everyday life because obviously they didn't truly fit into white society. Um, and there was a lot of poverty on reservations or just in native communities, so they struggled to you know, survive. Um, and while they were trained at these schools in some instances, the jobs they were trained to do back on the reservations were then taken by white people um, because they didn't want to pay natives. Um, so a lot of children suffered a lot of trauma and grew up to be emotionally crippled. Um, and when you suffer so much trauma, um, a lot, unfortunately a lot of students um, then turn to alcohol and drugs and abuse those in order to cope. And then once they had their own children, that cycle of abuse continued because they never had a you know, functioning, healthy relationship or life. Um, and so the children lost their ability to communicate with their own family members. Um, and a lot of traditional stories, foods, um, everything really about cultures diminished or disappeared entirely because of these boarding schools um, and what they wiped away from these children. So then my other part is about the sterilization that happened. Um, to native women. So this was another method of genocide imposing uh, measures intended to prevent births. And so this was kind of began with the eugenics movement during the late 1800s. And it kind of started with, in Christianity, as the whites were trying to assimilate the natives, in Christianity, women were seen as inferior. And so when the white settlers um, and the American government began to assimilate, um, and conquer the native cultures and people, the ideas of patriarchy also kind of transferred over to the natives, and so women were then put lower on their own social ladder. Um, so they had very, very little rights um, in their own communities and cultures, and those rights were eroded away further because of the white assimilation. Um, so the sterilization was either forced, coerced, or unknowingly. So. I also want to say the eugenics movement, most of you probably know that it's the idea of breeding to have the most favorable traits passed on. Well, it was kind of shifted to say 
people who have unfavorable traits should not procreate. So that was either race or intellect or disability. Um, they didn't want people with unfavorable traits to procreate, so they tried to figure out a way to you know, stop that. Um, and so in 1970, the Family Planning Act was authorized, which allowed sterilization of the poor. And the IHS, um, Indian Health Services, implemented the sterilization campaign in 1970 with federal assistance. Um, yeah. Yep, over 90% of sterilizations um, of Native women were covered. Yeah. One nine seven zero. People are just shocked. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, there was force, coerced, or unknowingly. So, force would literally be this would happen more to younger girls where they'd be taken and just like sterilized. Um, then, coerced, um, it would be actually, I want to say that the estimates for this between the early 60s and 70s, the estimate is between like uh, 3,400 and 70,000 Native women. Um, this large range is because the, it, there is evidence to show that there was 3,400 women sterilized, Native women sterilized, but this was only at six IHS hospitals, and there were a lot more than that, so, uh, Indian Health Services. And so it is believed by the drop in the census records that, um, about one in four women were sterilized. Um, and so this estimate is also out of the 100,000 to 150,000 Native women of childbearing age. So they really did a damage to the Native community by just sterilizing women. Um, so I think um, the birth rate between 1970 and 80, um, 1970 it was about four children for Native women. Um, as compared to like two for white women. And then only 10 years later, it dropped one whole child down to three um, for Native women. And it only dropped 0.28% for white women. Um, so that's kind of where we can get our idea that about one in four women were sterilized. Um, as I said, they could be taken from their homes. Um, the more popular methods were being coerced or unknowingly. So co coerced at like IHS facilities where a person would go in to um, have just a procedure under anesthesia. They would give like the informed consent to be like, oh, hey, we can sterilize you too while you're on drugs. And women would sign off because they were under the influence of drugs or anesthesia. Um, so they would sterilize them during that, you know, their other procedure as well, or um, coercion, they would say to women, oh, if you don't get sterilized, we're going to withhold federal assistance or rations from you, or we'll take away your children. There are a few reported cases where they actually took away a woman's children because she resisted sterilization. Yes? Can we go back for one minute to how somebody came up with those figures? Did you say it was because the birth rate had dropped yeah. compared to how the white birth rate dropped? Yes. And where does um, the availability of birth control fit into this, which would be right in line with that, right? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Well, uh, why do you conclude that the women were necessarily sterilized rather than that they started taking birth control like so many people Well, I was else going to get to that, but basically they believe that Native women were incompetent of being able to understand birth control, so they didn't give out birth control to a lot of women. They instead recommended sterilization because women, Native women, were just too stupid or unable to... No, that's not quite my question. It sounded to me like you were saying that those numbers come from somebody saying, well, because the birth rate dropped among um, Native people, it must be because they were sterilized. It's part but of it. What I'm suggesting is, isn't it possible that they also started to take birth control? No, I just said that. They said that Indian Health Services did not give out birth control. Yeah. The only option was sterilization. They didn't give birth control because they believed women were too incompetent to take birth control effectively. So they thought sterilization was the only way to reduce the birth rate. 
It's so, also if it's 0.28% decrease for white women and 25% decrease for Native women, that's 100 fold. So yeah. I think that. And it's in a 10 year span, and that does not happen without some sort of interference. And white women were getting birth control access, but a lot of the times the doctors um, at IHS facilities would recommend sterilization. Um, studies showed that it was between uh, 80 and 90 percent of doctors would recommend if a woman had more than three children and or was poor that she should be sterilized um, over white women. Did IHS offer abortions? That I didn't really look into. It was mostly um, hysterectomies or tubal ligations. Um, so if a woman came in and had birth then she would also sometimes be sterilized while they were helping her. Yeah, yep. Um, so then, um, sorry, trying to remember where I was. Oh, yes, um, as I said, like children would sometimes be threatened to be taken away if the woman did not comply. So then also what would happen is if a woman went in for like an appendectomy or a tonsillectomy, or any procedure, an incidental tubal ligation would just happen. Um, so they would just sterilize women unknowingly. Um, other times it was just blatant deception where they tell the woman, there was one instance that Dr. Pinkinson Yuri found where a woman was told that she could just have a womb transplant um, and have a child that way. Um, so Dr. Pinkinson Yuri was really important in kind of uncovering the facade that was going on behind the US government IHS doors. Um, and so another way that women were sterilized, not permanently, was the depo provera shot. And this was used on Native women when it had not been approved by the FDA. And this was during the 1970s. Um, and they wouldn't tell women, like, oh, the side effects may include um, long menstrual periods or missing menstrual periods. And then in spiritual and religious lives, the menstrual period can be very important in Native groups because it marks uh, a period of transformation and cleansing. Um, so not having a period or having one for too long actually brings shame um, to the women and they can't participate in religious and cultural activities. Um, and so as I said, like, the sterilization was so popular because doctors and healthcare professionals and the government believed that Native women um, and Native people in general just lacked the ability to understand birth control, how it worked, and how to use it effectively. Um, so they just preferred sterilization. Um, and then it's, as I said, 90, about 80 to 90 percent of doctors would recommend sterilization as a form of birth control to Native women simply because they had three kids and or were poor. Um, and they just thought them too stupid and incompetent to understand birth control. Uh, another um, theory, this hasn't really been proved, but another theory as to why sterilization was <coughs> preferred was that the US government um, didn't want the land that natives, that they had given natives to get used or uh, for natives to keep that because they realized that, oh, we gave native lands, lands that have a lot of natural resources like oil, gas, copper, coal, um, things like that. And they wanted the land kind of back. <coughs> the only way they could really kind of think of was to, you know, control the birth rate population in hopes that, you know, there wouldn't be enough people to either fight back or there wouldn't be a lot of people to then lay claim to um, the land. And so this is just kind of the wrap up that I kind of contend that, you know, the US government knowingly and for many, many years um, participated in committing genocide against the Native American people. And these are just two instances of how they went about trying to eradicate and exterminate an entire people and their cultures. Um, and they stripped away so much of Native lives and cultures. And still today, we are taught in high schools that the white settlers were benevolent and tried to help these natives um, and things like that. And that the native population diminished so much that in the early 1900s, um, shows like Buffalo Bill's Wild West, uh, 
showcase Native Americans in their traditional attire and activities, um, like building teepees, dancing, performing attacks on wagon trains. And this is so cruel in its irony that the white people had killed off so many natives that the Native American then became a trinket curiosity that they wanted to see all the things that they had just stripped away from the Native Americans. Um, so the boarding schools and sterilization were just two ways that the government and white individuals took away cultures and lives um, from the Native population. And sterilization is not that far away, like 1979 were some of the last recorded cases of sterilization. So it's really not that far away, um, unfortunately. And it's a past that I think should be talked about much more because it is, yes, a shameful past, but it's something we can learn from and try to make reparations and acknowledge that we did this horrible thing. Um, and then here are some recommended readings where I got some of my information and or that I think are very informative um, and just kind of help tell the authentic and real stories of the Native American individuals who lived through some of these times. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> a lot. Yes. Um, so a couple of things. Um, first, uh, weren't young ladies at the time wearing long hair? So why did they cut off their girls' fingers? Were they were aware of like the powerfulness of the hair within the tribes? Yeah, it was to take away any kind of meaning from them in any tribal way of life, and it was kind of a uniform haircut, like in the military, okay. uniform. Okay. Yep. And then um, you spoke of one person who had lived in the boarding house that was an awesome. Yes. Is that person up here? Yes, the first the one's first one. okay. Zikala Shah. Thank yes, you. of course. Yes. Was there something that happened in the late 70s that changed these practices? Um, so it was kind of the rise of feminism where white women were fighting for the right for abortions and unfortunately Native women were fighting the right to have their own bodily autonomy. Um, and it just kind of Dr. Pinkerton Yuri really helped to discover what was going on and it was kind of more publicized and published. And so it was kind of like, oops, we bad um, kind of attitude. So it did stop. But there were some instances where Depro Provera was still used. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it seems to be uh, like some sort of a racial thing going on. You keep saying white, you keep saying white. Yeah. I just want to reel the time back a little bit to the middle of the se uh, 19th century when uh, slavery, when the U.S. government was importing uh, Native um, uh, African Americans. And how, how did they view them? You know, what, you know, why would a country, a uh, U.S. government, go to war and, and you know, kill over half a million people uh, themselves? over slavery, but then at the same time try to commit genocide to, to the native. You know what I mean? It's, it was like going, was not going on at the same time. They're, they're, they're trying to kill the natives, the Native Americans, but at the same time, they're, they're, they're trying to free the slaves. I don't, I'm just confused well, at the thought process. In, of, of the government. It wasn't, I mean, yes, there was the abolitionist movement, but there was also motivations that the South produced a lot of manufactured so, so, goods. So was it purely economical? Was it, the whole thing, you know, I know slavery was, was, was economical. Yeah, you know, this was racially slavery. motivated. <laughs> yes, and so, so why wouldn't they do the same with Native? I mean, just that thought process. I mean, I'm trying to get into the head of Slaves had no land. Yeah. 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 So you can't yeah. take I'm trying to get the process of how they would think that they would actually have a civil war over African Americans, but then, at the same time, <laughs> well, an annihilate. Well, Natives them. also were... Natives were able to communicate more effectively and work together to fight the white, you know, American government. They also had land that they wanted. Um, they were also over a large expanse of territory, and it was harder. Um, and they found that the wars with natives didn't turn out to be as productive as they had hoped. And so they thought assimilation would be the best way to solve this and by reducing birth rates and things like that. Yes? Can you talk about the uh, closing of the schools? And it would be helpful if you had a map of the United States mm. showing where the schools were. Okay. Yeah. So the closing of the schools, it was one in part due to a decrease in popularity. Um, 
that a lot of Native communities and societies were starting to see the effects of the boarding schools and started resisting more heavily to that and didn't fall under the guise of the propaganda that was fed to them. Um, other part, they just weren't well funded because the government, I guess, had other fish to fry and didn't really care too much. They figured the natives were gonna die out, hopefully. Was their idea that there were so few of them, they just really didn't care as much. Were there any schools in New England? Most of them were in the West. Yes. Uh, I grew up near the Carlisle School. That's in Pennsylvania, in South yeah. Pennsylvania. But the Elliott School in Jamaica Plain, which is now an art school, uh, when it was first founded in the 1800s, was a, a school to teach um, African American children, but also Native American children and especially to teach them um, a vocation. So it was a vocational school. It's a part of their history that they don't talk about very much. Yeah, that, and I focused a lot more on boarding schools. So like the overnight, they were staying all the time, whereas other schools, they, it was day. There were, yes? More of a comment uh, than a question. So the United States government has had a long and unfortunately not illustrious history of separating children families and mm -hmm. parents. And they're still doing it. <laughs> but what really struck me is the word assimilation, which I won't use because the intent was not to assimilate. There was no intention of helping or, or introducing, integrating these people <coughs> into dominant American <coughs> society. It was designed to always keep them as the other, as over here. And I really think that instead of saying assimilation, I would say it's genocide. They wanted to kill them off. Yeah, so I did yeah. frame it as it was too a way of genocide, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to strongly recommend the book, Killers of the Flower Moon. Mm -hmm. People may have heard of it or read it, it's an incredible piece of research into the history, not exactly of this topic, but of killing Indians for economic purposes, and focuses on the Osage Indians in Oklahoma. Um, killers of the bottom of Yes? I just uh, am concerned because physicians, when they take their oath, they, uh, their, their first one is, do no harm. It's hard for me to comprehend that they would uh, do surgery that was not approved by the, the consumer. Well, a lot of times they believe that they were doing society a greater good by sterilizing these women because they were not, you know, they didn't have desirable traits or that they were having too many children. And a lot of these people were on federal assistance, so they were doing the public a good and they were doing no harm by doing incidental tubal ligations or hysterectomies. Yes? Can you comment on This is America. God bless America. Sorry, what was that? The Germans comment on what was happening in Canada at the same time. Uh, it's even in the 1960s. I mean, I didn't focus too much on Canada. I was focused more on here, so I apologize now. Pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah. You talked about a woman with three children. Would they ever sterilize a single woman who had never had a child? Would they ever do that? Yeah, if they were young or if they believe she didn't have desirable traits um, or if she was in for surgery already, like a tonsillectomy or appendectomy, just go in there and sterilize her while she's under anyway. Yeah. Where, where does that data come from? Uh, this data... Uh, I have all those resources. Um, so the data comes from them. I don't have a specific one on me. Um, the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity, I know I definitely got some information from there. Um, the US National Library of Medicine. So these resources would be where I pulled from. I didn't specifically remember each one. Yes? Um, so in 1978, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Act, when parents would say yes or no, they wanted the kids to go to boarding schools. Um, you know how, like, you talked about, like, feminism, like, the rise, and, like, mm -hmm. like pushing for, like, sterilization. 
What was the push for this? Because I know the government was just being like, oh, they should have the right to say yes or no for the child. So what was like, do you know? It, it was kind of discovered and talked about a bit more after all. Like, uh, to say like activists within the natives and like. Not one specifically. It was just kind of a collective trauma that you know yeah, most yeah, natives had experienced. There was, you know, <coughs> I mean, there definitely was, but I don't really remember if there was a specific movement. Yes. I'm just wondering. Um, the American Indian movement was very active at that time, and I would imagine that that would have um, led to the closing of these schools eventually. Yeah, that and it just, they weren't really funded that well and they weren't supported. Yes? I'm just, while we're talking about the timing of the closing of the schools, I am finding it interesting to notice that those forced sterilizations were being carried out in the early 70s and that the, that the option not to send your children to boarding school landed right about the time that the children who didn't exist because they could have been born in that time from those mothers would have been in school age. Yeah. And I wonder if the, the drop in population, the drop in available children, was part of what made them less viable. Yeah, kind of a drop. Yes? Um, and just going back to the science and kind of the hypocritical thing to do no harm, um, I don't have a source for reading on the eugenics movement, but the eugenics movement essentially provided the science behind why it was okay for doctors to do this as well, and the training for doctors to do this and have it be accepted practice. The eugenics movement, both here and internationally, really changed the face of medicine for a long period of time. And it was absolutely something, whether it was a physical sterilization like this, or just you know the immigration in, of Southern and Eastern Europeans in kind of the 1910s to the 1930s, there was a lot of eugenics that informed the way that these people could be educated, that informed the way that um, these people should be living. So, yeah. you know, for a lot of doctors, that was their background, that was their science, that was their education, because eugenics was considered a scientific movement at that time by many, many, many people. Very few people, you know, yeah, it was went against it at first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know you guys have lunch, so <laughs> if you have any other questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm the marketing director at College. Oh, hi. Yeah, and we just, um, I just wanted to know we just tweeted your session. Oh, gave us some credit, and um, we're gonna see. I don't know if they, do you know if they recorded you? I don't know. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. If you're interested in like working with us on a future yeah. story or something, absolutely. Yeah.